relatively similar, similar chemistry and similar uh, uh, habitats and that kind of thing. Uh, so I, I don't see, you know, obviously you see two people, for example, I, I adopted my daughter. She's 25 now, I adopted her when, I'm 15, when she was 15. When we go to conferences together, everybody says, oh, we can see how much you two look alike. <laughs> yeah, we look alike, but it's not because of common ancestry. You know, uh, so it's not clear that, that, that similarity definitely means common ancestry. So that was the first point. And now I've forgotten your other two entirely. One was on Genesis. What was the middle one? Oh, well, the pygmy, right. Um, in Australia, now I'm not real up on this because this is rather new. In Australia, they found a very small uh, fossils, fossils of a very small hominid. Um, as I understand it, um, the argument is these hominids are only t uh, 100,000 or 200,000 years old in their framework. I'm not sure about this, but it seems to me the way I remember it is they were actually competing with modern humans in the, in the, in the author's view. So I'm not sure he would consider those part of the human line. Uh, he would actually consider them sort of a what we call an evolutionary dead end. Uh, and I think, if this is the paper I'm thinking about, uh, he actually talked about how their size was an indication they were an evolutionary dead end. But I'm not, I'm not sure. But that, I think that's the way he, he phrased it. Uh, in terms of my view of Genesis on, what was it? Being the image oh, being created in the image of God. What does that mean? I honestly think that means we have a moral sense what does it mean to be created in the image of God? We can, we're, we're rational, we have a moral sense, those kind of things. We have free will. These are the I images of God that I think we're created in. I don't think God necessarily has two arms and two legs. Right. Oh, I see. Not created in the image. So the argument, is, the, the idea you have is that some of these other things that were discussed in Genesis, such as the giants who roamed the earth, uh, were sort of human-like, but not created in the image of God, so they didn't have some of the characteristics we have today. Uh, I'm not sure. I'm really not sure what, how, what, to, what to think about that. Uh, I, there's a lot of different ideas about what, that, what those passages really mean, and I'm not knowledgeable enough in that area really to comment intelligently on it. So, but I appreciate the question. Um, kind of a question I have kind of towards evolution as a whole is, I mean, I was always taught that as, like, if a protein gets changed or denatured, that it's no longer functional. So, I mean, like with sickle cell anemia, that part of that whole line gets changed a little and then it's not able to do the job that it's told to. So something as big as like bone structure that has all these muscle attachments to it that would make us go from monkeys to where we are today, it would seem like we would become extinct because our bodies wouldn't function to be able to mutate to that degree. So the question is, when it, you know, when it comes to mutations, you've got, you've got a, you know, very well designed or very, very complex systems. You add just a little change to that and suddenly it won't work anymore. You take a protein, you denature it a little bit, it doesn't do its job anymore. Um, you actually brought up sickle cell anemia. Sickle cell anemia is actually, even though it leads to a disease, it's actually considered to some extent to be a benefit, even though it can lead to, uh, uh, um, uh, you know, anemia. It can lead to being weak and so forth. You don't clog your arteries as much either because of the shape of the cell. So, you know, under certain conditions, sickle cell anemia might actually be a positive thing. You know, if you've got a, a, a some population of people who are genetically predisposed to have a lot of uh, heart problems, sickle cell anemia might make them weak and tired a lot, but they most likely won't have heart attacks. So, you know, there are trade-offs that are involved, and I think in terms of evolution, that's what, you're, that's, what, that's what you're hoping for. You're hoping for these mutations to occur that, at first glance, may look bad, but in the end will provide some benefit that will end up, and, and, and remember, evo in, in evolutionary terminology, the transitional forms don't have to be all that, benef all that benefited. You know, it's just the final product, the one that actually survives for a long time. They're the ones that have actually adapted to their niche really well. 
All right, so theoretically, a transitional form could have a lot of problems in between. But like the bacterium that was mutated and became uh, uh, immune to the antibiotic, if the population is being exposed to something really bad, and a couple mutations occur that make whatever systems that exploit less efficient, I can survive that bad time and along the line carry a few more mutations with me so that by the end I get to somebody who's even more, you know, uh, uh, ready, you know, even more fit, even though some of the transitions might not be. Okay, so I, you know, I, I'm, 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 I'm just trying to give you the evolutionary view as best I understand it. You know, that, that these kind of things are possible, at least to some extent. The problem that I always see, though, is what I was speaking earlier to him, was information. Mutations tend to destroy information, and until we can find a way to add information to the genetic code, I think you're in a real problem evolutionary-wise. Um, yes, ma'am. Is as important or revolutionary as those ideas at that time. So the question is, uh, you know, back in uh, uh, history, we know that, that Galileo and, uh, and 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 folks like that, who were fighting the reigning dogma of the day, of geocentrism, they were fighting it with heliocentrism. They were, you know, uh, Galileo was put in uh, uh, solid, not solid, house house arrest under house arrest for his views and was supposedly not supposed to teach them and so forth. But they they had a lot of opposition to them. And is this current debate where you've got the reigning dogma of evolutionary uh, uh, views uh, and those small minorities of, of us who are fighting against that view, is this debate the, the same magnitude? Uh, you know, I, I don't think of things in such grand terms. Uh, all I do know is this minority camp of creationists has gotten bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. That's what I see. So if, if you're asking me if this is a grand debate, I don't know, but I do know the debate is getting stronger and not weaker. You know, and, and I think you expect that because I honestly believe science is telling us evolution doesn't work. And so it only takes science some time to get around to that. Now, it does take science time to do that. You know, it took science thousands of years to give up spontaneous generation. And to some extent, some scientists still believe in spontaneous generation today because they believe in abiogenesis, which is spontaneous generation happening once a long time ago. So, you know, it took thousands of years to get the idea that maggots don't come from decaying meat. Uh, so it's, it, it'll take time to get rid of other views as well. I mean, it took us a long time to give up Newton's framework of physics as the only way to go to allow for a more probabilistic interpretation of, of uh, things in terms of quantum mechanics. So these things take time. Uh, but I do think overall the debate is getting bigger, not smaller. And I think that's a positive thing. that this would ultimately lead to people believing in intelligent design. And what would that ultimately mean then for people believing in a God? So do I think that this debate uh, is going to open up more people's belief in, uh, in, in, belief in God? Uh, because they're seeing you know, the lack of uh, ability of naturalism to explain so much. I would hope so. I would certainly hope so, and I think to some extent you can see that. Uh, if you believe, you know, uh, a lot of these folks like the Answers in Genesis group, the Institute for Creation Research group, they post all sorts of testimonies on their websites of people who say, you know, I wasn't even considering uh, believing in God until I started seeing some of this data that you're presenting. So I, I hope that's true, but the main thing I hope it really, uh, as a scientist, is simply that science is better off as a result. Uh, I'm not sure that in the end science is, science is going to go to creationism or intelligent design or something like that. I don't know. If nothing else, I think it'd be a big win for science if it just became less dogmatic uh, and allowed you know, uh, several views of origins in besides just the one that doesn't seem to work. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Um, coming from a creation perspective, I do have a question about the, um, where evolution does fit in. Are there... Oh, where does evolution fit in? In a creationist perspective, where does evolution fit in? Let me just talk from a scientific perspective. Uh, from a scientific perspective, if you're defining evolution as simply change, then evolution occurs all the time. All right. 